Sometimes an event involves two experiments. For example, suppose we're talking about the event of flipping a coin and rolling a die. So we have these two experiments within the one event, you see, of, of doing those tests. Now think about the sample space. What are the possible outcomes for this? Well, flipping a coin, we know it can be either heads or tails. And rolling a die can be one through six. So we could have heads associated with a one on the die, or a head associated with two, head associated with three, four, five, or six. The tails, each, uh, the, the tail could be associated with each of the items on the die as well. So we have 12 possible outcomes here. And if we want to figure a probability, like what's the probability of uh, flipping the coin and having it turn up heads and then rolling the die and having it turn up five, then we would look over here, how many favorable outcomes are there? Well, let's see, a head and a five right here, there's one out of the 12 items that are possible. So the probability then is one over 12. And what about the probability of uh, uh, flipping a tail and having the die come up even? Well, tail and even, let's look over here at the sample space. We would have even, even, even here with the tail. So there are three items like that in the sample space of 12. So three out of 12 or one fourth. Now, there's another way to proceed with this kind of situation. We could be using the word and here where the comma is. The probability of flipping a head and rolling a five on the die is the way we could read this. And the and statement is a rather special situation in probability. And it is associated with a certain kind of, of event or certain kinds of events. Now, it's important in evaluating the and statement to evaluate whether or not we have independent events. Now, events can be independent or dependent. We're going to talk about both, but let's talk about independent events first. It turns out, you see, that the calculation can be made rather easily for the AND statement type probabilities if we have independent events. It turns out that all we need to do is multiply the separate probability numbers for the two different uh, uh, little experiment. So, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to independent events. Independent events are, are those events where the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of the outcome of the other. So we have no uh, sort of interference from the outcome of one to the other. And certainly this example of flipping a coin, rolling a die, those are independent events. They're completely separate from one another. It doesn't make any difference whether you roll a head or a tail uh, to affect the probability of rolling any particular thing on the die. That's the idea of independent events. Now when you have independent events, uh, the probability of A and B is calculated as the probability of A times the probability of B. Now let's come back over here and think of these calculations in terms of what we learned over here. You see, the, the probability of head comma five could be thought of as probability of head and five, and we can make the calculation because these are independent events, we can calculate the probability of head separately and multiply that times the probability of rolling a five on the die. The probability of head on the, the coin is one-half. The probability of the five on the die is one-sixth. One-half times one-sixth is one-twelfth. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of handy when the sample spaces become particularly large. You see, <clears throat> here we were able to write the entire sample space, and we were able to look at the sample space and select favorable outcomes and count uh, possible outcomes very, very easily in this particular problem. A lot of times it's, it's not quite as easy as that. And so this uh, idea of multiplying probabilities is a real neat thing. All right, the, let's do the other one here uh, using this idea of independent events. The uh, probability of a tail and even would be the probability of tail Well, let me write it like this in the, in the, with the and word in here because that's usually the way we start. The probability of tail and even. 
you see, would be maybe the way we would start. And, and then we would evaluate the, whether or not we have independent events. We do here, so we would think, okay, we can calculate this by going, uh, by writing probability of tail times probability of even. Now, the probability of a tail in tossing a coin is one half. The probability of an even number in rolling a die, there are three even numbers out of six. That's three out of six or one half. I'll write it as three out of six. This reduces to one half. One half times one half is one fourth. And the probability number is the same as we calculated before, of course. Well, let's, uh, let's make some other calculations. Let's, let's continue just a little bit. And I'm thinking now about rolling a die and drawing a card from a deck of cards. Now, think about sample space here. If we were going to write the entire sample space for experiments involving rolling a die and drawing a card, rolling a die, there are six possible outcomes here. And each of those outcomes has to be associated with each of the 52 cards. So we would have a one on the die associated with a two, a card two. And the one would be associated with three. And the one and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even talking suits here yet, am I? So the one is associated with the two of hearts, the two of diamonds, the two of spades, the two of clubs. The one is associated with, huh, do I really want to go through all of these? Go like this. No, I don't. What I, what I want to be able to do is make the calculation without looking at the entire sample space. So think about whether or not we have independent events, rolling the die, drawing a card, and certainly the... Uh, the outcome uh, here, the occurrence of whatever happens over here, has nothing to do with the probability of some occurrence over there. So we have independent events, and when we have this AND statement, we can write this as the probability of rolling a 4 uh, times the probability of drawing a king. And now, the probability of rolling a 4 is 1 out of 6. The probability of drawing a king is there are four kings out of the deck of 52, so it's four out of 52. This, one, this is one over 13, and when we multiply, we get one over 78 as the probability. Probability of even and diamond, let's see, that would be the probability then of even times the probability of a diamond. And the probability of even, when we're rolling a die, there are three even uh, numbers on, on the die, so it would be 3 out of 6. And uh, the probability of a diamond, how many diamonds are there? There are 13 of them in a deck of 52, so it's 13 out of 52. Both of these will reduce a bit, and when the smoke clears on the reduction and multiplication, it turns out to be 1 eighth. Now, consider this one. Suppose we're drawing a card, and then we're drawing another card. And we're talking about uh, the probability of drawing an ace and a king. Now, we might think, okay, we're just going to draw two cards from the deck of cards. Hmm. Are we going to put the first card back when we draw it or not? Let's assume that we're going to put the first card back. Okay, if we do that, then it's worked this way. The probability of ace times the probability of king, or 4 over 52 times 4 over 52, or 1 over 162. Now, this probability stayed the, as we would expect it for drawing a king out of a full deck of cards simply because we replaced the ace. What if we didn't replace the ace? What if it's without replacement? You see, if we're talking about without replacing that first card drawn, without replacing that ace that we drew the first time, then we change the probability of this. And so this idea of drawing two cards from a deck without replacement is an example of a dependent event because uh, the, the, the selection, that first selection of a card affects the probability of the second selection of a card. Now to, to calculate this, to make this calculation of probability, we, we do this. We think about the probability of drawing an ace. That's 4 and 52. Now we think about the probability of drawing a king, given that the ace has already been drawn. You see, so the ace has already been drawn. That's one card out of the deck. Now the probability of drawing a king, there are four kings still in the deck, and there are 51 cards now in the deck. 
so 4 out of 51. This is a notation that we're going to use when dependent events are, in, are involved. It is the given idea, given that the first I item has already occurred. So, to summarize with dependent events, the probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A has already happened. Or it's the probability of B times the probability of A given that B has happened. You see, either way you calculate it, it's going to be the same thing. So when we calculate something like the probability of ace and ace, you see, without replacement here, we're talking about the probability of ace times the probability of the second ace given that the first ace has been drawn. So the multiplying the probability numbers, this would be 4 out of 52. And if the first item drawn was an ace, then there are three aces left, 51 cards. So 3 out of 51 is the probability of drawing that second ace. Multiplying here, the, the uh, probability is 1 over 221. Sometimes probability problems have the word or involved. We talked about the and word and what that could lead to. The or word can lead to interesting situations as well. Suppose we uh, want the probability that in a deck of cards we draw an ace or a king. Well, let's see, ace or king. The favorable outcomes would be aces or kings out of the whole deck. Now, if we're looking at the sample space like this, you know, we have our four suits of cards. Each suit has 13 cards in the suit. If we're thinking about aces or kings, we can draw any of those cards, or we can draw any of those cards and have a favorable outcome. So there are four eight cards that give a favorable outcome out of the whole deck. Okay, sounds reasonable. This then is eight out of 52, which can reduce. Uh, and it reduces to 2 in 13. All right. Now, another way to, to look at the situation, uh, you might think, well, gee, maybe there's a shortcut. There was a shortcut when we were talking about the AND statement. We multiplied probabilities in certain circumstances uh, when the AND statement was involved. And it turns out here that we can think of this as the probability of ace plus the probability of king because we have a particular set of circumstances that lends itself well to this. And uh, the aces, let's see, this uh, turns out to be uh, there are four aces out of 52. There are four kings out of the 52 cards. That's the eight out of 52. And let's see, dividing four, both uh, numerator and denominator, it's two over 13. Okay, so the same idea. <clears throat> so we can add probabilities. Now con consider this. The probability of a queen or a heart. Queen or heart. Well, if we look at the sample space, we're thinking about the queens. Those would, would, uh, would be favorable outcomes. Hearts, those would be favorable outcomes. Now, if we count all of these cards along with all of those cards, then we would count 4 and 13. But when we count these 4, we're talking about the Queen of Hearts. When we talk about these 13, we're also talking about the Queen of Hearts. So we have an item that we're counting twice. So if we're going to get just the items that are in the sample space that we want, just those favorable outcomes, and not do some double counting, we would think of all these hearts, the 13 hearts, including the Queen of Hearts, and the other queens. So it would be 13, 14, 15, 16. So we're talking about 16 favorable outcomes out of the 52 cards. And I'll leave it in unreduced form just for the time being. Now, so does this imply then that we could make the calculation as the probability of a queen plus the probability of a heart? Uh, certainly not, because the queens would be, that this would be 4, over 52, and this would be 13 over 52, which would give a miscount, a double count on the Queen of Hearts. It turns out to be 17 over 52 and not 16. So, this brings us to a situation where 
if, if the, uh, the two situations have something in common, then we're going to do some double counting and we have to accommodate that. Now, this uh, leads us to another idea of certain kinds of events. We're talking about mutually exclusive events or events which are not mutually exclusive. It turns out that the first example over there involved mutually exclusive events. Second example involved events that were not mutually exclusive. Uh, and uh, events that have no outcomes in common are mutually exclusive events. And the Venn diagrams are very good in showing or illustrating uh, what a mutually exclusive events are and what non-mutually exclusive events are. In our ace-king idea over here, we were talking about the probability of drawing an ace or a king. Uh, if we're thinking about uh, the, the box contains all the cards and a deck and this circle contains the aces and that circle contains the kings, notice that they have nothing in common. On the other hand, in the other example, when we talked about the queens and the hearts, uh, this circle contains the queens, this circle contains the hearts, and the queen of hearts is in both of those two sets. So, the, in this situation, the intersection of the two sets would be the empty set. In this section, the intersection of the two sets would contain something, would have something in them. All right, so that's the idea of mutually exclusive. Now, let's get to the formula idea or, or some notion of a formula involving mutually exclusive events and non-mutually exclusive events. With mutually exclusive events, we found earlier that the probability of A or B can be calculated as the probability of A plus the probability of B. Just add the separate probabilities of the two uh, items uh, that are in parenthesis. All right, so adding probabilities for mutually exclusive events. Now for all other events, and in fact for all events, we could use this idea, the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability that both things happen at the same time, you see, or, in, in, or can occur at the same time. So we have to subtract out that probability. And, you know, if we, if we apply this idea to uh, our calculation earlier, let's come back over to this side and apply the idea to this queen or hearts business. You see, it's the probability of queen plus the probability of hearts minus the probability of the queen of hearts. Now, the probability of the queen of hearts, there is only one queen of hearts, so we would be subtracting out this 1 over 52. And now, this gives us the 16 over 52 that we were looking for. So, it's the pr one probability plus the other probability minus the duplication is what we're subtracting out here in this part of the problem. Understand that uh, this second formula can be used for mutually exclusive events because in mutually exclusive events, the probability that both items will occur is zero. So we're not subtracting out anything. So this is kind of a universally applicable uh, formula when we're talking about the OR statement. Let's look at a couple more examples. The probability of red or face card. Now we could perform a little analysis right here and think about do we have mutually exclusive events or not? And, and uh, to be able to tell, is there such thing as a red face card? That is, can, can both of these happen at the same time? We have red, we also have face. Yes, there are red face cards. Uh, so these are not mutually exclusive events. So what we're going to have to do is use the general formula, the idea of the probability of red pro plus the probability of a face card and subtract out the probability of red face cards. So let's see, the probability of red well, half the deck is red, so that would be 26 out of 52. And uh, we add the probability of face cards. There are, let's see, there are uh, kings, queens, and jacks, and each of them has four involved in them. Four times three, that's 12. So that's 12 out of a total of 52. And we're going to subtract the red face cards, and let's see, two of each of those groups of four turns out to be red. You see, we have the hearts and diamonds of the kings, the queens, and the jacks. That's two, four, six. So we're subtracting out six out of 52 in this uh, area. And now it's 26 plus 12, that's 38. 
uh, minus 6, that's 32. So it turns out to be 32 out of 52, and uh, it reduces, but the reduction is not terribly important to us. It's this part that we're interested in. Now, what about the probability of heart or club? heart or club. Now, we could start the idea by, by saying, gee, do we have mutually exclusive events? Can we have a card that's both, both a heart and a club? No, we can't. So we don't have mu Or we could, we could just say, well, let's just use the general formula because the general formula works in all cases. And we could then approach it like this. We're just going to add probabilities and subtract out duplication. So it's the probability of hearts plus the probability of clubs minus the probability of both. And the probability of hearts, there are 13 hearts uh, in the deck, so it would be 13 out of 52. That's one-fourth. Plus another 13 out of 52 for the clubs. And then subtract out, hmm, the probability of both can't happen, so the probability there is zero. Zero out of 52, or simply zero. 13 out of 52, 13 out of 52, that's 26 out of 52, uh, which is one half, and that's, that's half the deck as we know uh, because we're taking half of the red cards and half of the black cards to get a total of half of the deck. At Hopewell Electronics, all 140 employees were asked about their political affiliation. The employees were grouped by type of work as executives or production workers. Here's a chart of the results of the survey. Now, over on this side of the chart, employee type, executive, and we're going to mark that with E, and production worker, mark that with PW. And over here, there are political affiliations, Democrat, Republican, Independent, and the number of people involved. Now, remember, this is executive and this is production workers and Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. At the bottom we have totals for the Democrats, the Republicans, and the Independents. And over here there's another total having to do with the executives and the production workers. And the total number of employees altogether is 140. So that's the layout of the chart. Now we'd like to answer a few questions uh, involving the information in the chart. First question, probability of D. D, Democrat. Okay, if now, the, when we say probability of D and, and make the calculation, we're assuming that a, an employee in this company is chosen at random. And what is the probability that that person will be Democratic? Uh, so we come over here and we say, okay, well, we've got uh, the Democratic idea. These folks in this uh, column are Democrats. So we have five executives and 63 production workers that are Democrats for a total of 68. So the, if we're talking about the entire group of uh, employees at the whole plant, uh, then the probability that that employee is Democratic is favorable outcomes over possible outcomes. So it's 68 over 140. So 68 over 140. And that will reduce or it will change into a, a decimal. If we want to write it as a decimal, it's 0.486. All right, the probability of executive. Well, the executive, let's see, we come back over here. The executives are along this row. So we have uh, five Democrats, 34 Republicans, nine independents for a total number of executives of 48. Now, these two problems are just designed to get us familiar with the layout of the chart. So we have a total of 48 executives. So 48 favorable outcomes out of a total uh, possible outcomes of 140. So the probability of selecting an executive out of all of the employees is 48 out of 140 because there are 48 executives out of the 140 employees. And again, this can be written as a, uh, as a decimal uh, as uh, 0.343. Now, what about the probability of Democrat given executive? Democrat given executive. Let's come back over here. Given executive, the probability of Democrat given executive. When we're given something, that's a condition on this probability. It is the condition that the person being selected uh, is definitely an executive. 
All right, so we're talking about these rascals, and the probability of Democrat is five. There are five Democrats in this group of executives, you see. So Democrat given executive is five over 48. So five over 48. And again, a decimal is associated with this one, and it turns out to be this. Now, are events D and E, Democrat and Executive, independent? You know, when we talked about independent uh, events earlier, we were talking about such things as drawing cards and rolling die and, and that kind of thing. And we were saying that uh, does the outcome of one have anything to do with the probability of the outcome of the other? And that was sort of the acid test. Well, we, we can't quite... Uh, put our finger on how that applies here, can we? I mean, and when we were talking about drawing a couple of cards from a deck, it depended upon whether or not the first card was replaced or not before the second card was drawn. And again, we don't have that luxury. The, uh, the, it turns out that to test for the independence of events in a situation like this, uh, what you do is you ask yourself, is the probability of D equal to, is it equal to, the notion of the probability of D given E. Now, let's see, the probability of Democrat, we had uh, calculated that up here as 486, and uh, the probability of D given E was calculated here as this, and certainly these are not equal, and therefore, no, uh, these are not independent events. All right? They're not independent events, then how are we going to calculate the probability of D and E? Well, the AND business, remember when we're talking about independent events and we're talking about the AND statement, we multiply probabilities. It would be the probability of D times the probability of E. But these are not independent events. These are dependent events. So we have to use one of the two uh, formulas that we talked about before. Or we can use the sample space or our chart, you see. Now, intuitively, let's, let's analyze the situation. The probability that someone chosen is a Democrat and an executive, all right? Democrat and executive. Let's come back over here. Here's the, the column of Democrats. Here are the executives. For the, how many folks are both Democrats and executives? Well, just this. You see, because it's the intersection of the executives with the Democrats. Democrat and executive. There's only five of them. So a random sample that's, that's, uh, that's just choosing one out of the group, uh, there are five favorable outcomes and 140 possible outcomes. So it would be 5 over 140. So let's see. Let me put that out uh, over here. This is what we're finding intuitively. Now what about some kind of formula? Well. We, we said that uh, because these are dependent events, that uh, there are actually two ways to do this now. It's the, it's the probability of D times the probability of E given D, or it's the probability of E times the probability of D given E. Now what does all of this mean? Well, let's see. The, I'm going to just do the last one because I have a little bit of room here. Uh, the probability of E, the probability of executive. Now we figured that earlier as there are 48 executives total in the company, so it's 48 over 140. All right, now, what about this part? This is the tricky part. The par probability of Democrat given executive, given executive. Now, we actually calculated that earlier as well, but let, let me just rehash that a little bit with you. Come on back over here. Let's go to the chart. And we want Democrat given executive. So given, so we have a constraint or a condition on the probability here. Given executive, we know we've got an executive, now, what's the probability that that executive is a Democrat? Well, 
the Democrats that are executives, there are five of them, you see, and it's the condition that we're only talking about executives, so it's five out of 48. And that's, that's what's important to realize here, is that it's five out of 48, not five out of 140. So five out of 48, and uh, the 48's cancel here, so we have five out of 140 which is the same fraction that we have up here. Both can be reduced, but that's not the point here, really. Okay, what about the probability of D or E, Democrat or executive? Well, again, we can take kind of a, um, an intuitive view of, of the situation, and uh, alternatively, we can use a formula. Now, Democrat or executive, let's come back over here and, and look at or count Democrats or executives, which would meet the favorable outcome idea on this probability. So let's see, Democrat or executive. So it's these 48 or these 68, but we don't want to count the 5 twice. You see, so it would be the 63, the 34, the 9, and the 5 only counted one time. Uh, that's one way to think about it. So 63, 5, 34, none. That's, that's a way to calculate it. The other way is to use the formula, and I didn't bother to add the, let me, let me add them. Let's see, this would be uh, 68, 34, that's 90, that's 102, and 9, that's 111. So it should be 111. Intuitively, we're finding that it's 111 out of the 140. So let me just write that down. Now let's use the formula. The idea with an OR statement um, is to, we can use the general uh, formula, you see, for um, whether or not, we don't have to e evaluate whether we're mutually exclusive or not. We're not mutually exclusive because there are folks that are Democrats and executives and therefore the, the two groups have something in common and uh, we can apply the general formula. And that's what we're going to do. Okay, so it's the probability of Democrat plus the probability of executive minus the probability of both. Now, I'm just going to write the word both here. You might get into the habit of doing this. You might want to write, it's a little more formal, a little more correct to write the probability of D and E, you see. And D and E we calculated up above. But at any rate, uh, this is a, a rather intuitive kind of way to, to look at it, though, I think. The probability of D we figured before as 68 over 140. There were 68 Democrats out of the 140 uh, folks in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the building. The probability of executive, there are 48 executives, so that probability is 48 out of 140. And then we subtract out the probability of Democratic executives. How many Democratic executives were there? Well, we found that to be five. We saw it over there in the chart. Five over 48. Excuse me, five over 140. And uh, then when the smoke clears here, we find this to be 111 out of 140, and that's what we found when we looked at the situation kind of intuitively. You draw two cards from a standard deck of 52 cards without replacing the first one before drawing the second. First question is, are the outcomes on the two cards independent? Are they independent? Well, we, we need to meet the definition of independence if the, uh, the outcomes are to be independent. The notion of independent events is that the outcome of, uh, of one event is not dependent upon the outcome of the other. That is, the happening of one event does not affect the probability of the happening of the other. And certainly, if, if we're not replacing that first card, then we're changing the sample space for the drawing of the second card, and therefore uh, the two events are dependent. So we would answer like this. No, because drawing the first card changes the probability of drawing the second card. Let's find the probability of drawing 3 on the first card and 10 on the second card. Now the AND tells us that we're going to multiply probabilities, and since the probabilities are dependent, we have a 
uh, the, the second item is a sort of a given item. It's the probability of three times the probability of ten given a three on the first card. The probability of drawing a three, well, there are four threes and a deck of 52 cards, so the probability is four out of 52. Now, once that, uh, that three is drawn, it leaves, and not replaced, uh, it leaves only 51 cards in the deck. And so the probability of drawing a 10, there are four 10s, but the number of cards in the deck is now 51. Now, 4 over 52 is reduced to 1 over 13, which gives 4 over 663, or 0.006 for the probability number. Now, this problem looks almost the same. Find the probability of 10 on the first card and 3 on the second. It's sort of the, the same problem in reverse. Uh, it's going to be the probability of 10 times the probability of 3 given 10 on the first card. And it's the same exact idea. The probability of drawing a 10 from a deck of 52 is 4 out of 52 because there are 4 10s in the deck. The probability of drawing a 3 given that a 10 appeared on the first card is, well, let's see, there are four threes in the deck, but now the deck only holds 51 cards, so it's four out of 51. And once again, we reduce and then multiply straight across and get the same probability number that we had before. At Litchfield College of Nursing, 85% of incoming freshman nursing students are female and 15% are male. Recent records indicate that 70% of the entering female students will graduate with a BSN degree, while 90% of the male students will obtain a BSN degree. If an incoming freshman nursing student is selected at random, find. Now, we wanna, we're going to ask some questions in a moment, but let's organize the information we have before us. Uh, we noticed that 85% of the freshman nursing students are female, 15% are male. 70% of the female students will graduate, 90% of the male students will get a degree. So we can organize the information like this. 85% of students are female, and of those, 70% will graduate. 15% are male, of those 90% will graduate. Let's answer some questions. First uh, part says, what's the probability that a student will graduate given that the student is female? Probability of graduating given that the student is female. Now, the, the probability number is actually given in the, in the outline of the problem above because it says that uh, of those female students, 70% will graduate. So a student chosen at random will have a 70% or 0.7 chance of graduation. What's the probability that a student is female? Now, a student is chosen at random from all of the students. A student chosen at random is, well, we want the probability that the student is female and that the student will graduate. So the probability that the student is female times the probability that the student will graduate given that they're female is the way to make the calculation. Now notice the, the dependence idea here because the graduating students in the outline above depend upon the percent that are graduating depend upon their gender. So we have a dependent situation here. Now the probability of being female is 85 percent. 85 percent of the of all students are female. Now once you're in that female category, the probability of graduating is 70 percent, so 0.7. And then the product is 0.595. Now here's another way to look at the situation. Suppose we we make an outline. I want to show you actually two ways of, of calculating these uh, probabilities uh, uh, involving these students. One way is to deal with the outline at the top of the screen. Another way is to take a rather uh, fundamental view of the situation and think about favorable outcomes over possible outcomes in terms of numbers of students. Now to put numbers onto these problems, I'm assuming that Litchfield College has 100 students because 100 is just an easy number to work with and corresponds well with the percent numbers. We could just as easily use 148 or 10,000 or any number that we'd like 
just that 100 works out pretty well and is easy to, to as I say, calculate. All right, let's fill in uh, the information or some of the information in this chart. Uh, the number of female and male students, well, if the total number of students at the college is 100 students and 85% of them are female, it means that 85% of 100, 85 hundredths times 100, or 85 students are female. And in a similar way for the male students, 15% of 100 or 15 students are male. Now, what about for the graduates uh, of those two categories in each gender? Well, we're told from above that of the female students, 70% will graduate. So that turns out to be 70% of 85. So the number of graduating female students will be 59.5. In a similar way for the males, 90% of 15 will graduate, or 13.5 students is what we're talking about. Now we can, we can make our calculations in an alternative way for the, the items in question. Uh, for example, from that B part, it was the probability that the student is female and the student will graduate. Well, let's see, female and will graduate. The, this is the female column, and the graduates are along this row. So the females that will graduate, we have 59.5 of those. And calculating the probability number as a favorable outcome over possible outcome kind of, of calculation, it's... Uh, 59.5 students will graduate that are female and out of the total of 100 students at the, at the college. So the favorable outcomes over possible outcomes gives us the same result as we had before by multiplying percents. Here's our original outline and let's consider another problem. The probability that a student will graduate given that the student is male. Very similar to an earlier problem involving the females, but uh, we want to just talk through, work through this uh, in a way that we did before, in a similar way that we did before. Now, actually the, the probability number is given in the outline because we're told here that uh, of those male students, 90% will graduate. So the probability that a student will graduate given that the, that student is male is 90%. So we're, we're putting that student into, the, automatically putting that student into that category, you see, just in the outline above. So it's the probability is 90% or 90 hundredths. Now, let's look at it another way, just using the fundamental idea of numbers of students. Uh, student will graduate given student is male. Well, here's the male students that will graduate. You see, given the student is male. We're limiting uh, our sample space here by saying given that the student is male. And that's a very important aspect of calculating probabilities, especially when we're talking about favorable outcomes over possible outcomes. So the favorable outcomes would be 13.5 students. The possible outcomes, the possible number here, we're given that the student is male, so there are 15 male students. So our probability number is 0 .90, as we found earlier looking at the outline. What about the probability that a student is male and the student will graduate? Well, again, we, we think of, gee, both of these things happening, the, the male idea, the gender idea, and that the student will graduate. Well, that puts us into this 13.5 students. And, uh, but the sample space here is the entire population of the college. So favorable outcomes, 13.5. Possible outcomes, 100 students in the college. And the probability number is 0.135. One, three, five. Let's work the problem another way using the outline. Probability a student is male and the student will graduate. Remember, and implies that we're multiplying probabilities and we're talking about a dependent situation here. So it's the probability of male times the probability that the student will graduate given that the student is male. Probability of a male student is 15% or 15 hundredths. The probability of graduating given that the student is male is 0.90, 90%, you see. And the product is, as expected, 0.135. What about the probability that a student will graduate, period, regardless of gender? Uh, it's, it's important to understand that this is regardless of gender. And it turns out that we're going to look at the problem like this. We want to notice that those who will graduate are either males who will graduate or females who will graduate. 
and we can write it like this. The probability of uh, being a male graduate or a female graduate is what we're talking about here. And when we talk about or, we're talking about adding probabilities and uh, because these two incidentally can't have anything in common. There can't be a graduate who is both male and female, so we don't need to subtract duplication out of this situation. But the probability of being a male graduate from our calculations before is 0.135. The probability of being a female graduate is 0.595, and the sum of those, 0.73. Now, what about looking at it a different way? Now, remember, the probability was 0.73. And let's see if we don't get the same thing looking at the numbers. Okay, probability that a student will graduate. Well, where are those graduates? Hmm, they're right here. So 59.5 male students graduate, 13.5 uh, female, excuse me, 59.5 female students will graduate, 13.5 male students will graduate. The sum is 73, so 73 students overall will graduate. That means that the probability of graduating is 73 over the total number of students at the college, 73 over 100.73 as we expected. The events described by the phrases is female and will graduate and will graduate given female seem to be describing the same students. Now certainly that, that part is, is correct. We are describing the same students female students that graduate. So why are the probabilities, P, probability that the, the student is female and will graduate, and the probability that the student will graduate given female, why are they different? Why are those two different? Well, it has to do with sample space, and we can see it easily by looking at the outline of the numbers of students in these categories. You see, in both situations, the probability that is female and will graduate, probability of will graduate given female, they have the same favorable outcomes. The same numerator of the fractions is going to be 59.5. Those are female students in the graduation category. All right, now, but when we are talking about the given female business, our sample space is only 85 uh, people uh, uh, because there are 85 females on campus. So the fraction is 59.5 over 85. On the other hand, when we talk about and will graduate, just generally on the campus, we're talking about a sample space of 100 students. So the sample space is different in the two calculations, and that's the, the whole idea. So we can write our answer like this. In the case of and, the sample space is all students both male and female. In the case of given, the sample space is restricted to females only. One issue that often arises in calculating probability is counting the number of items in the sample space and uh, listing maybe the items in the sample space. And we want to talk about some techniques for doing those things. One technique is called a tree diagram, and we can set up a tree diagram like this. Uh, an example is, is worth a lot of explanation. Suppose we're talking about flipping a coin and rolling a die, and we want to make a tree diagram of that situation. We establish a starting point and then think about the first idea, the uh, notion of flipping a coin. What are the possibilities? Well, we can get a head or a tail. So we go off from that starting point and we establish the position for head and tail. And now, what about the second item, rolling a die? Well, from that point, we could, get, we could roll either a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And we could do the same thing for tail, one through six. Now, with the tree diagram, uh, uh, several things are possible. We could list our sample space in a way like this. We have here, this, the end of this tree, the end of this branch is, is a one, but it, it came from right here, the head, so we have head one. So this is really H1, and this one represents H2, and then H3, and then so on all the way down to the, to the bottom. And from looking at the tree diagram, we can easily see that there are 12 items in the sample space, and we can list those items here. We can give them sort of a name or a label uh, if we go down another column like this. Okay, 
Suppose we take the same idea, but we roll the die first. Roll the die, then flip the coin. Well, it's the same idea. We have a starting point, and we think about the first thing that we're going to do, the first uh, part of, uh, of or the first experiment. Rolling the die means we come up with six different possibilities. So we go to these six different positions and we label them. And then the next part is to flip a coin. So from each of these numbers, we go out and we have two choices. So it's head or tails. And now, once again, we can make a, we can label. Uh, this is the, the position of one head. You see, and a comma might work out here. No comma, that's fine. Whatever kind of uh, uh, notation you want to use is okay. This is one and then tail. And then this is two and then head. And then and two and then tail. And so on. So we would have another list of all of them. Suppose we want to make the tree diagram. We're going to go with a tree diagram from the beginning now and, and uh, show how the tree diagram takes shape. Uh, suppose we're talking about three tennis matches and we want to list all of the win-loss sequences involved. Well, we would start and for the first match we would either have a win or a loss. Those are all of the possibilities. So at this point, this is what we, where we are with, uh, at the end of the first match. Now, what's possible after that? Well, whether we have won or lost the first match, in the second match, we could either win or lose. So, let's see, from here, then, we have the possibility of a win or a loss. And from here, we have the possibility of a win or a loss. And at this point, we have finished our second match. Now, what about the third match? Well, after we have won this match, after we have played two matches, whether we have won or lost, we have uh, the opportunity to either win or lose the third match. So from each of these points, we go out and we offer those choices, win, loss, win, loss, win, loss. And my tree is not real pretty, but from here now we can write the sequence that gets us to the outer part of each of these branches and list all of the possible sequences, the win-loss sequences for the group of three matches. So here, where did we, how did we get to this point? Well, we got to this point with a WWW, so it's win, win, win or match one, two, and three. And I don't have quite enough room here to, to, to label the third match, but I would presumably do that. But uh, now, where are we here? Well, we get here from win-win-loss. And then to this point, it's win-loss-win. And to this point, win-loss-loss. And then down here, uh, we have a win, but we started out with a loss over here, so it's loss, win, win. You see, and then here, loss, win, lose. And then lose, 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 win. And then lose, lose, lose. And let's hope that doesn't occur. But at any rate, these are all the possible sequences by looking at the tree diagram. We see that um, if we're talking about what's the probability of, of one of these, we can count here and see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight items in the sample space. So we could actually write a probability here if we thought that all of these uh, items were equally likely to occur. Suppose we had, and th this is a little bit different than the previous problems. Suppose there are five balls in an urn. They're all the same size, but they're, uh, they're, there's, there are different colored balls involved. Three of them are red, two of them are blue. Now, we, we want to write um, the possible sequences when we draw two balls. 
and we're not going to replace the first one without replacement. And we want to calculate probabilities for each of those sequences. Okay, so when we reach in the urn the first time, remember three red balls, two blue ones. So what are the possibilities? What can we draw out of there? A snake? No! We draw out a ball and it's colored either red or blue. So we have these two choices. Now these choices have associated with them a probability and we can write the probabilities uh, here along our, our branches. Uh, the red, there, there are three red and two blue and there's a total of five balls. If three of them are red and they all have an equal chance of being drawn, then the probability of drawing the red is three out of five. The probability of drawing a blue, if there are only two blues out of the five, then the probability of drawing a blue is two out of five. Okay, now, after we have drawn one of these balls and set it aside, thrown it away, there are now four balls left in the urn. And what are our possibilities then for drawing the next ball? Well, after a red ball has been drawn, then one of these reds is not in there. There are only two reds left and two blues. All right, so the possibility though still exists that we can draw a red ball or a blue ball. So after drawing red, we could draw another red or we could draw blue. And after we've drawn a blue ball, after we've drawn one of these blues, there's still a blue left in there, so we could still possibly draw a blue. So after we've drawn a blue, we could draw either a red or a blue. Now, what about probabilities? Let's think about that. See, after we, at this point, we have already drawn a red ball. And so, at this point, there are only two reds and two blues. Now, what's the probability at that point, given that the first ball was red, what's the probability that the next ball is going to be red? Well, let's see. If we've got, uh, at, at this point, we have two reds, two blues. So, we have two out of four is the probability of drawing another red. Now, after that red is drawn, what's the probability of drawing blue? Well, it's two and two, you see, so it's two out of four as well. All right, let's come down here. What if the first ball drawn was a blue? That's what this implies. So the blue is gone, and now what's left in the, in the urn is three reds, one blue. So three red. I could even make a note of that. Three reds, one blue. So what's the probability then of drawing red if I've got three reds and one blue? I've got a total of four balls. Three of them are red, so it's three out of four. And the probability of blue would be one out of the four. Now, what about the probability of these various sequences? The probability of red, red. The probability of red, blue. The probability of blue, red. The probability of blue, blue. Well, we can figure that rather easily now that we have gone through and thought carefully about each of the separate probabilities uh, at all stages of the event. Um, we can now simply multiply probabilities. That is, the probability of red, red is the probability of red times the probability of red on the second ball and the probability of red on the first one, I'm looking back over, it was three out of five, and on the second one, it was, uh, let me look back over here. Oh yes, here it is, two out of four. So it's three-fifths times two-fourths, and back over here, two-fourths. You know, to be technically correct, I ought to uh, say that this is red, given red, you see, given that red occurred on the first one, what's the probability of red on the second one? That's what we're really calculating here. All right, we have a little uh, cancellation. This is one half, one half times three-fifths turns out to be three-tenths. 
And then for the next one, the probability of red then blue is the probability of red times the probability of blue given red. And we just look over at the chart. The probability of red here is three-fifths. We know that pretty much. Uh, but the probability of blue given red, let's come back over here. So blue given red. Given red, what's the blue? All right, that's the two-fourths. All right, back over here. So we have two-fourths once again. And that also turns out to be three-tenths. Uh, probability of blue-red, well, it's, it's blue and then red given blue. So let's, let's multiply the two. And we can come back over here and just see what we're multiplying. It's two-fifths times, you see it's blue-red. So it's two-fifths times three-fourths. So back over here, two-fifths times three-fourths. And uh, let's see, a nice cancellation occurs here, and this turns out to be three-tenths. And then for the last one, the probabilities are right here on the chart, two-fifths times one-fourth, two-fifths times one-fourth. So back over here. And now a cancellation occurs here, and this turns out to be one-tenth. It is interesting to notice and, and maybe to verify the validity of these in, in a, a fashion is to notice that these probabilities add to one. And they have to do that. These are all of the possibilities involved in the situation. Three-tenths, 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 that's nine-tenths, and one-tenths, that's ten-tenths or one for the sum of the probabilities. In making tree diagrams, uh, in order to tell the number of items in the sample space, all we need to do is count the items at the ends of the branches of the tree diagram. Now, recall the situation where we flipped a coin and rolled a die. Uh, we just count the number of items at the end, and we found that to be 12. Well, think about it this way. In, in tossing a coin, there are two possibilities. There are two possible outcomes. In rolling a die, there are six possible outcomes. Two times six is 12. Now, this idea is, uh, can be used. Just multiplying the possibilities at each stage of the game gives us a way of counting. Now, sometimes this is called the fundamental counting principle or the multiplication principle of counting, something like that. But at any rate, it's the notion of multiplying options as, at each stage of the game. Consider this problem. How many three-digit area codes are possible if the first digit of this three-digit area code cannot be 0 or 1 and the last digit cannot be 0? Well, we have a three-digit area code and all we do is just place, place a blank for each of the possible digits in the area code. Now, let's just think about choices. Now, how many digits are there? There are 10 of them. If the first digit, though, cannot be 0 or 1, then this first digit, we have only 8 choices for that digit. For the next digit, how many choices do we have? Well, there are no restrictions for the second digit, so there are 10 possibilities. For the last digit, the last digit cannot be a 0, so there are 9 possibilities. So multiplying here, then, there are 720 possibilities for area codes. There are, there are 720 possible area codes given these restrictions. So all we're doing is multiplying the possibilities, the number of options that we have in each stage of the game. Here's another example. How many three-letter words are possible? Now, by a three-letter word, I'm not limiting us. I'm putting words in quotations because I'm assuming that AAA is a word, you see. So uh, even though we don't have, have uh, vowels or do have all vowels or whatever, they're all words, okay? So, Three-letter words. Well, let's see. One, two, three letters. What are our possibilities for the first letter? We can choose from any of the 26 letters of the alphabet, so we would have 26. For this one, 26. For this one, 26. And so multiplying 26 times 26 times 26, we would get 17,576. Now, what about if we were talking about the same idea but without replacement? Without replacement, that means that if we use A as the first letter, we can't use A as the second letter. So uh, A-R-A is not a word. Uh, we have to disallow that. Well, how can we disallow that in this circumstance? Well, let's talk about our possibilities. Um, we have three-letter words. 
And uh, we have the entire alphabet at our disposal here, so it's 26, number of choices for this one. Now once we've chosen a letter though and used it, we can't use that letter again. We're not, uh, it, it is not an option for choice here. So the next number of items for choice is 25, and then after that, 24. So 26 times 25 times 24, or 15,600 for the number of three-letter words without replacement. Here's another one, same idea. How many ways can eight books be arranged on a shelf? Well, if we have eight books, we have eight positions, eight uh, positions for choices. I'm just going to write eight blanks. And how many choices do we have for the first book? Well, if we're looking at our eight books, we have eight books to choose from. After, after we've placed that first book on a shelf, we only have seven choices for the next book, and then six for the one after that, then five, then four, three, two, and one for the last choice. Well, this, uh, this brings up an interesting uh, situation. Uh, this idea of, of taking a number and multiplying times every counting number all the way down to one from that value that we start with is the notion of factorial. And uh, this actually is eight factorial that we have written up here. It is eight times seven times six times four, six times five times four times three times two times one. And uh, it turns out that the value is 40,320 for eight factorial. So the notion of factorial, and it's uh, the notation for factorial is the exclamation point. Um, and we'll look, we'll be using factorials quite a bit. Here's a, a, a variation on the same theme. Suppose we have eight books, but there's only room for three books on a shelf. How many arrangements are possible? How many arrangements of three books are there if we're choosing from eight books? We're taking eight books and we're arranging only three of them. Now, how many different arrangements are there? Well, we again uh, multiply our choices. It is simply, let's see, for the first book we have eight items to choose from, and then for the second we have seven and then six. Eight times seven times six, 336 arrangements are possible. Now, all of what we've been talking about is the notion uh, mathematically of permutation. The idea of permutation, when we talk about permutations, order is important. And the, whether we have importance of order or not is going to be important for us to determine when we make calculations about permutations. We're going to go on with a, another discussion in just a little bit about combinations. Uh, but to be able to recognize and determine uh, whether a problem involves permutation or combination, we're going to, to test to see if order is important. If order is important, it's a permutation. If order is not important, it's going to be a combination. Now, in order to pick off, in order to pick off whether or not order is important, often in this kind of problem, the word arrangement is used. How many arrangements of those books are possible, you see. So how, how many arrangements of numbers are possible to give those area codes? All of those different arrangements re imply that order is important and leads us to the notion of permutation. There's actually a formula associated with the notion of permutation. Here is that formula. Notice it involves uh, factorial. And the notation for permutation is this, and there are a couple of options here. This is the permutation of n things taken r at a time. For the eight books, three on a shelf, it's eight books and we're selecting three, or we're arranging three at a time. So that's, that's the idea of the placement of these two. The notation could also be the permutation of n things taken r at a time written like this. Interchangeable parts here. Now, notice that in the formula, it's the n here, the number of items you have factorial over the number of items you have minus the r, the r at a time. How many at a time are you taking? You subtract that here and take the factorial of that difference. Uh, let's use the formula here in this, uh, this previous problem. 
In fact, let's use the formula in both of these two problems. Uh, first, uh, for this one, if we're thinking about it as a permutation formula kind of problem, it's n things take an r at a time. Uh, for this purpose, it is, well, I'll tell you what we ought to do. We should when you use the permutation formula, write it down just like you normally do with other formulas. You should write n factorial over n minus r factorial. And then we're talking about the permutation of eight things taken three at a time. So it is eight factorial over eight minus three factorial. Now eight factorial means 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, all the way down to 1. 8 minus 3 is 5 factorial. Now let me put this denominator here. I'm just going to show you a little shortcut uh, that you can take from time to time. 8 minus 3 is 5, so this is going to be 5 factorial. Now when you, you begin to write the, the, uh, the numbers in the numerator, this is 8 times 7 times 6 times 5, and when you get to 5, you can stop because you can just call this 5 factorial. Instead of writing 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, it's 5 factorial, and so we have a cancellation opportunity here. So we have 8 times 7 times 6. 8 times 7 times 6, that's exactly what we had up here. You see, so we're really multiplying the same digits to, to get the, the same results. You would kind of expect that. All right, on this one, if we're using the uh, permutation formula, we're talking about, gee, we, we have eight things, but we're arranging all eight of them. So it is the notion that it is, and the, the formula once again is n factorial over n minus r factorial. All right, so for, our, for this problem, it is the permutations of eight things taken eight at a time. So we're arranging all eight items. So it's uh, eight factorial over eight minus eight factorial. Now in the denominator, we have zero factorial. And this is a special definition in the factorial world that eight zero, excuse me, zero factorial is defined to be one. So this is eight factorial over 1, and the 8 factorial is just what we had up here. So the importance right here is the 0 factorial is defined to be 1. Permutations and uh, factorials can be calculated using the calculator. On the TI-83, we would press the button marked Math, and this is the menu that shows up. We would like to be in this area, in the probability area, so we'll cursor to the right and then cursor down. Now notice the items that we're looking for. Here's our, the permutation uh, calculation and here is factorial. Let's use factorial first. Um, we will access factorial when we enter a number and, and here's the way we do it. We are going to go back to a main screen and I'll find let's say 25 factorial. Now I want to take the factorial of 25 so I'll go math and then cursor to the right and then item number four and 25 factorial, I'm pressing enter again, is this number. Now notice it is in scientific notation and uh, it's because we have, we have 25, you see this E means times 10 to, uh, to the 25th power, so we would have to slide this decimal point 25 places to the right in order to get the exact value of 25 factorial. Factorial numbers can get awfully big awfully fast. Well, let's talk about uh, the permutation idea. If we calculate the permutation of eight things taken three at a time, which we were looking at just a moment ago on the board, then we would enter the eight and then go to the math menu, cursor over to the right, down to, whoops, down to the permutation of n things taken r at a time, press enter, and now we want 3. You see, so it's the n is the 8 and the r is the 3, you see. And we enter the 8 first and then the permutation notation and then the 3 and then press enter to give 336 as we expected and as we found earlier on the board. Suppose we go back to the example of having eight books, but this time, how many groups of three are possible? Now, not how many arrangements of three out of the eight, but how many groups of three are possible? 
Now, if we're talking about eight books, and, and uh, consider three of the books. Think about uh, Treasure Island, Swiss Family Robinson, and say Tom Sawyer. Now, if they're arranged like this, Treasure Island, uh, Swiss Family Robinson, Tom Sawyer, if I put Tom Sawyer over here and Treasure Island over there, it's a different arrangement, but it's the same group. You see, so this isn't the same thing as just taking 8 times 7 and multiplying times 6. So it, it's not just using that, that counting principle that we were talking about, that multiplication idea. We have to actually use a formula here. And this kind of situation is called a combination. And in the combination situation, order is not important. Order is not important. Often the word group or the word committee will be used in this situation. But the formula for calculating uh, combination is very similar to the formula for calculating permutation. Here's the formula, and notice the notation, and I'm using the n things taken r at a time with both the n and the r on the same side of the c. Another way to illustrate that, or another notation that is appropriate, is the n combination of n things taken r at a time like this. And another way to note this, another notation is n things taken r at a time like this in parentheses. Well, at any rate, the, the difference in the, the formula for combination and the formula for permutation is this r factorial in the denominator. And this is just in this formula for combinations to divide out those duplications that we were talking about in this problem. Now, back over here then, to solve this problem, we would begin by beginning with writing the formula. And then fill in information into the formula. Notice I'm changing the notation back and forth just so we'll be familiar with both. N factorial, that's the number of items that we have. And oh, I, I should actually write the numbers for the n and the r here. We're talking about eight things taken three at a time. So we're talking about eight factorial over uh, eight minus three factorial times three factorial. So now it's, it's one of those things, it's a manipulation problem from here. It's 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 and so on all the way down. Actually, we can take a little bit of a shortcut here by saying 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial. And I know we can do that because 8 minus 3 is 5 factorial. And then here we have 3 factorial. So the five factorials can go out, same factors involved in both of those, you see. Three factorial is three times two, that's six. We get a cancellation opportunity here. But at any rate, we end up with 56 as the number of groups of three that can be taken out of eight. Let me show you a shortcut. Before we leave this problem, I'd like to show you a shortcut right here that uh, instead of writing what we wrote, uh, we can take this kind of tactic and it is to say that in the numerator, the numerator will be composed of, you see if it's, if it's eight things taken three at a time, the numerator can be thought of as being composed of three factors starting with eight. So we can go eight times seven times six and the denominator is simply the three factorial. So this is 3 times 2. You see now this is 6, that's 6, they go out 8 times 7, 56. So either way you do it is fine. This is just a little trick, a little shortcut trick to deal with combination formulas by hand, sort of, if we're doing the manipulation ourselves. We'll look at the calculator on this in just a few minutes uh, because that's probably the fastest way to deal with this. Here's another problem involving a combination. How many different five-person committees are possible from a class of 20 students. Five person committees from a class of 20 students. Well, we know it's a, a combination because we're talking about committees, groups, order is not important. So we would immediately go to the idea of the combination of n things taken r at a time is n factorial over n minus r factorial times r factorial. And for our problem, it's the combination of 20 things taken five at a time. Notice the different notation. 
uh, which is 20 factorial over 20 minus 5 factorial times 5 factorial. Now the shortcut here is to say, well, in the numerator we're going to have 5 factors starting with 20. So we could write this then as 20 times 19, 18, that's 3 factors. Here's 4 factors, here's 5 factors. So 5 factors starting with 20. In the denominator we have 5 factorial. And now when the smoke clears on all of this, it turns out to be 15,504 groups of five, committees of five, that can be taken from 20 students. Let's use the calculator to determine the number of five-person committees that are possible from a class of 20 students. We have 20 students or 20 items. We want to take that five at a time as a combination. So we enter 20, press math, then over to probability, and then down to combinations, press enter, and then 5. Now notice again, as we, as we found earlier, that the idea is that the, the 20 is the n things, and the 5 is the r at a time. So they are on their respective sides of the combination notation. Pressing enter, we find that number to be 15,000 504 as expected. In the Colorado State Lotto game, there are 42 numbers. Players choose any six. Then the state selects six of the numbers at random. The winning tickets are those on which the players' six numbers match the state's six numbers. The A part of the question is, from 42 numbers, how many groups of six are possible? Now, how many groups of six are possible? Notice the word groups implies that uh, we're not interested in the order in which the numbers are chosen, just whether or not we have a group, uh, kind, of, kind of like a committee idea. So we have a combination notion here, and we use the combination formula which is given here. Now for our uh, problem, it's the combination of 42 items taken six at a time, which is 42 factorial over 42 minus 6 factorial times 6 factorial. And the shortcut, as we looked at earlier, uh, would mean this, that in the numerator, we'll have uh, six items, six factors, starting with 42. So we would write 42 times 41 times 40 times 39 times 38 times 37. In the denominator, we have 6 factorial, which is 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And uh, then when the smoke clears on the cancellations, we find that that total number is 5,245,786. Quite a, quite a lot of groups of 6 that are possible from it, just 42 numbers. The next part of the, the problem says, if you buy one lottery ticket, what is the probability of winning the grand prize? Bear in mind that this many groups of six are possible. So when we talk about favorable outcomes over possible outcomes, this five million some odd number represents the number of possible outcomes. So, and we're, we've got only one ticket, so the probability of winning is 1 over that 5,245,786, which turns out to be this very long decimal. Notice how close this decimal number is to zero. Zero would imply that you cannot win. This number is extremely close to zero. Now, let's change the problem a little bit. What if you buy 10 lottery tickets? Now what is the probability of winning the grand prize? Maybe it's increased a great deal. Well, let's see. The probability of winning then, favorable outcomes, we have 10 tickets. So it'd be 10 over that 5 million number. Hmm, and when we divide this out, all we're doing is eliminating one of the zeros to the right of the decimal point. Well, it doesn't change the probability that, that much. It doesn't give us a uh, the inside track in winning the lotto just because we've bought 10 tickets, you see. This number is still very close to zero.